In this first lecture of mine, I'm going to be talking about the process we come to acquire knowledge, how our mind acquires contents and uh, knowledge and experience. And then secondly, how psychology was formed, how it sort of developed from philosophical schools into early psychology. And in the first half of this first half, so the first of four parts, we're going to talk about rationalism versus empiricism. So the lecture as a whole, it's in four parts, and last week we covered some of the main philosophers of mind from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and their views on the mind and the body, on good and evil, as well as some more, more ancient Greek philosophers. Today we're going to focus on how we acquire knowledge from birth onwards, which will take us to the end of the Age of Enlightenment, and that is the age in the middle uh, 15, 16, 17, 1800s, where people were questioning received wisdom, questioning religious and other political organisations, and thoughts and beliefs. And then we're going to move on to the first case of psychology as its own discipline. And that's the second half of this first lecture. And the key schools of thought that we're going to be looking at are in two broad categories. So on the epistemology side, and that's a word meaning uh, how we acquire knowledge. So it's the study of how we acquire knowledge. We're going to look at rationalism and empiricism, a little bit of dualism from um, Descartes, and then some alternative Kantian and Leibnizian views about epistemology. And I'll briefly mention natural philosophy, this idea that philosophy about nature, about bio biological and mental beings. And then in the second half, early psychology. What are the schools of thought that psychology developed from? So we're going to look quickly at phrenology, which you may have heard of. And this is a form of faculty psychology, about the different faculties that the human mind and brain may have. Then something which approximates modern experimental psychology, psychophysics and introspection. And these are two schools of thought in the 1800s and early 1900s. Epistemology is the stuff of thought and where it comes from. And the aim in this part of the lecture is for you to learn about the different philosophical perspectives on how we acquire knowledge. And the two in particular that we want you to focus on are rationalism. This is associated with Descartes, René Descartes, and his method of doubt, so doubting his sensory and mental experiences and seeing what he can, he can work out using his reason. And the second one is empiricism, and that's associated with Locke and Hume. And they're talking about how sense, very basic sensory experiences can become more complex ideas in the mind. And we're going to look at some problems of these methods and maybe some solutions and see if maybe Kant, Immanuel Kant's epistemology, and maybe Leibniz, who criticised both rationalism and empiricism, see if they can come up with something, something else. And there are some interesting looking words there associated with Kant. So, how do we acquire knowledge? The rationalists, like Descartes, would say that we're born with certain kinds of knowledge. And this knowledge comes from, from God. And all other knowledge we can work out through reason uh, and from first principles. So you can start from very basic forms of knowledge, which is innate, and you can build up all of your knowledge from reasoning about the world. And this is rationalism. So rationalization, uh, rationale. These are words uh, to do with reason, using your reason to come up with knowledge. The second alternative is to get knowledge from our experience. So just, just from our senses, our sensory experience of the world as we move around and acquire knowledge from experience. And this is empiricism. Now the, the two forms of epistemology differ according to where the knowledge comes from, but also 
how we acquire the knowledge and how to go about acquiring it. So this has been distinguished according to descriptive versus prescriptive knowledge. On the descriptive side, the rationalists would say that some ideas come from God, they're innate, or else they come from pure reason. And because of this, because they come from God or because they've come from pure, unadulterated reason, these ideas can just be true of, in and of themselves. So God, mathematical proofs, logical proofs, certain morality statements, they're all just true in and of themselves. The empiricists would disagree and they'd say that all ideas come from experience and there are no such thing as innate ideas. They're all, um, to distinguish from a priori, they're all a posteriori. So they come from sort of after experience. So you get some experience and then you look back and say, ha, I've got some, I've got some ideas now from my experience. It's a looking back. Whereas innate stuff is a priori comes first. So as well as where this knowledge comes from, the two schools differ according to how to acquire the knowledge. And the rationalists would say the best way to get new knowledge is pure reason, just to just to use your, your mind and your, your thoughts and your reasoning processes to get new knowledge. And the reason for this is that the senses can deceive, can deceive us. There are illusions and there are uh, misapprehensions of the world. And only pure reason can give us certainty about the world. And the empiricists would say just the opposite, that uh, reason is, is faulty. Reason probably doesn't exist. There isn't much to reason about uh, when you're born. So the best way to acquire knowledge is just by experiencing the world sent it through your senses. And science and experimental, the empirical methods, provide a good approach to get new knowledge. These thoughts aren't new. They didn't just... Um, spring from the uh, 16, 1700s, uh, but they, they can be traced back to ancient Greece, just like many ideas. And rationalism and empiricism uh, relate a little bit to Plato for rationalism and Aristotle for empiricism. So you can search through those texts and find some quotes that look a bit like empiricism, like there is nothing in the intellect that is not present first in the senses. So these are long held ideas, but we're just going to look at the 16th and 1700s versions of them. So rationalism first, and we're going to France with Descartes. And Descartes was the first of the modern rationalists. And he, in a quite extended way, came up with this phrase cogito ergo sum. And that means, I think, therefore I am. And by a process of reasoning and and in fact, doubting what he was thinking and doubting that his senses were telling him, he reasoned that we must know, at the very least, we must know that we exist, that we are a thing that thinks. And that's, that's all we can really be sure of in some cases. Our senses, our dreams and experiences, they may all be false. Evil demons or God himself might deceive us. So how can we really trust anything that we receive through our senses? But the one thing we can trust is that we are we do exist and we, we are able to think. And that's why I think therefore I am is so critical. But that wasn't the only thing that Descartes thought we could think. And there are other kinds of innate ideas. And for example, the idea that God God must exist. God exists. Um, and Descartes stated that the true ideas which are innate in me, of which the first and most important is the idea of God. And you can relate this to a platonic sort of idea in that perfect, perfect ideal objects and, and things in the world can't really be encountered. So the perfect triangle or God himself, we can't really ex experience these. So the knowledge of, of these sorts of perfect things must must be innate. It must already be in your brain and your mind when you're born because you can't possibly experience these perfect things. Descartes asked us to consider a simple candle. He said 
But a candle changes from being solid wax, which is solid and cold and painless and still, to molten wax, which is liquid and hot and painful and moving around. And he said that these solid and melting wax have very few sensory qualities and experiences in common, but we know that they are the same thing. So how do we know that they're the same thing? And he said this ability to, to see the same thing in different forms must be innate, because it can't possibly rely just on sensory experience. On the other side of the empiricism-rationalism debate, we have Locke, John Locke. And he, I guess, was the first modern empiricist. He argued, opposite Descartes, that the basis for all the mind's content was sensory experience. Now, it's not the same as saying the mind is born completely empty. It has the machinery to, to pick up all the sensory experience, and it has the machinery to have appetites and to remember things and to imagine things. But the way we know anything about the world, any content, is from our senses. Further, he argued that, the, argued that there were no innate principles or ideas of any kind. So if an idea was innate, then everyone in the world should agree on it. We should all have the same ideas when we're born. But there is no such idea that everyone agrees upon. And he concluded that ideas that, that ideas are not present in newborn babies at all. They just don't have any ideas. And he further concluded that if reason only is able to reveal the old knowledge that we already hold, then our minds must be full, completely full when we're born. Instead, he concluded with this famous phrase, that the mind is like a tabula rasa, a blank slate on which the contents of the mind are, are then written by, by new sensory experience. Locke's idea was that you can generate more complicated ideas and notions by, by combining and relating and generalizing the simple ideas. So he said combination, relation and generalization were three ways to make more complex ideas. So an apple is red, but it's also round and it's sweet if you taste it. So all, the, all these individual sensory qualities of, a, of an apple combine to make the concept or the, com the complex idea of an apple. Or you can relate two ideas together to, to, to generate a new sort of meaning. So um, you could say, my son is like a vulture when he eats. And he's not literally a vulture. And your son doesn't join together with the vulture. But you learn something new by combining, by relating these two ideas. And then there's generalization. So... I could go out into the park on a Monday and I could see a white swan. I could go out again on a Tuesday and I could see a couple of white swans. I could go out on a Wednesday and see five white swans or no white swans. But on a Thursday, I don't, if, I don't have to go out. I can just say, I'm, I'm pretty sure all swans are white. And I can generalize from my specific experiences in different times and places. I can say that all swans are white. So I've learned something new by generalizing from specific combinations of previous experience. Another empiricist, this time from Scotland, is David Hume. And he developed the empiricist view and distinguished two kinds of sensory experience impressions, which are very basic sensations from touch, hearing, sight, smell and taste and, and the other senses. And then he said there were ideas, which are impressions that you think about and recall later with memory. And these impressions and ideas were then bound up into the foundation of more complex ideas. Now, these complex ideas may not have been experienced directly, just as Locke said, or I said, rather, I said about a minute ago, that not, you know, all swans are white because I saw some swans yesterday and they were white and I saw some on Monday and they were white. Hume thought that complex ideas 
don't need to have been experienced directly. So you can think about unicorns. So you can think about a rhino uh, and a carrot and a horse and a My Little Pony and all those things. You've seen them individually, but if you combine them all, you get a unicorn. And so you don't need to have experienced everything directly. You can combine your own imp impressions into complex ideas. And a, cri and a criticism of, of Hume's sort of approach is that it's it's called bundle theory or a bundle man so a man is just made up of a bundle of perceptions a bundle of sensations and there's nothing really more to it than that and Hume further distinguished two kinds of ideas two kinds of areas of intellectual inquiry and academic uh, research um, you could talk about the relations of ideas and matters of fact. And he said that all, all particular claims about knowledge must be either how different ideas relate to each other, or they're just simple matters of fact. And he didn't like really talking about anything that couldn't be one of these two things. So uh, metaphysics, which is, you know, the, what is the, the true nature of the universe, you know, beyond our perception. Um, he just didn't have any time for that. And also divinity, so God and, and, and the existence of, of other, other dimensions of being. He didn't have any time for that either. We should just get rid of them. They're not proper subjects of philosophical inquiry. So Hume's approach was pretty simple. You look at a thing and you find the ideas to which a particular term is attached or related. And if you can't find any ideas for a particular term, then that term must have no meaning. So take the example of God. If you can't say, oh, I've seen God, you know, he's, she's a six foot tall Amazon dwelling person. Uh, if you can't, if you can't link it to some sensory experiences, then the term must have no, no meaning. And for more complex things, if you can't break them down into their components and you can't trace each simple idea back to its sensory impressions, then it really doesn't have any meaning at all. And we shouldn't consider it in philosophy. So Hume then was really a radical skeptic. He doubted everything. He doubted religious claims and concepts. He doubted whether there were any causal relationships between events that we could discover. He doubted whether even induction, so generalizing from past to future experiences, so he, he doubted Locke, he doubted Locke's swan generalization. And he doubted the existence of anything called the self, so we, whose we are the thing that perceives ourselves. So you, you can't possibly perceive yourself because you are itself the thing that's perceiving. So he doubted everything. He was a radical skeptic. And that's a problem. So if we compare again rationalism and empiricism, and let's take Descartes and Hume as the, the opposite ends of this scale. Descartes said that the existence of God could be proved just by reason alone. But Hume denied that such concepts can have any meaning at all. And Descartes said, we can't even trust our senses and Hume said, it's the senses are the only things that we can trust. So this is a real crisis. What do we do from here? If you have questions about this session, write them down. Come along next week and we'll discuss.